So it's my great honor and pleasure to welcome you all today to the inaugural event of the Center for Contemporary South Asia and to our academic year planning calendar. And I think this panel and the turnout today is actually a really nice showcase of the rich intellectual life that we have worked together to try to create um, at the center. And in as much as democracy is unfortunately under threat in India and across the world, it is not here at the Center for Contemporary South Asia. So what we want to kind of begin by saying is that we really welcome and appreciate both your participation at events such as this and the ones that will follow through the course of the year, but also in terms of your suggestions um, and counsel of how our programming can evolve and other things that we can do to support you, because that's really um, what the center is for. And today it's a testament as much to the strength of the center as it is to a generosity of our panelists that we have been able to convene um, really about the best panel on Indian elections uh, that I could have imagined. Uh, Many of these people today on the panel are people whose work you would have read and learned from in classes, but also critically on the Indian elections. And so sitting here are three people at least whose columns and public writing I read and learned from as someone who works on Indian politics, but not on Indian elections. Uh, these were informative and instructive for me. And so this particular elections, India's 17th, which recorded the highest turnout since independence, as you know, returned Modi and the BJP to power with an, enhan with an enhanced majority. And today, collectively, um, the idea is to both understand uh, the causes, but also the implications uh, of this historic election. And so we will go in the order that I will introduce the speakers, and I'll introduce them now, and then hopefully they can just come and take the podium uh, and speak for about 15 minutes each so that we'll have plenty of time for your involvement um, in this panel. So uh, first off, we will have Professor Pradeep Chibber, who is uh, fortunately no stranger to Brown. Um, we had organized a book adda for him here a few years ago on his book on religion and politics in India. But uh, Pradeep, who's the professor and Indo-American chair in Indian studies at the Institute for South Asian Studies at the University of California, Berkeley, is as prolific as he is rigorous. So since then, he has continued his work on party systems um, and the politics of India and has recently published an excellent book, for those of you who haven't had an opportunity to read it, with uh, Rahul Varma called Ideology and Identity. Um, it's a book I had the great good fortune of reading over the summer and learned very much from. Uh, second, we will have uh, Professor Milan Veshnov, who again, luckily, has been to Brown and graced us with his presence and intellectual camaraderie before. Milan's book, uh, again, an excellent book that helps us understand why Indians elect criminal politicians, was also uh, the subject of a very lively uh, book adda. For those of you who haven't been to one before, a uh, book adda is a format in which we try to bring together the author authors and respondents for an important book that has been published in South Asian politics and put them into debate uh, with each other. And I think it's been a very successful format and we've hosted quite a few, Ashu? six um, over the course uh, of the last few years. Uh, Milan is a senior fellow in the South Asia program at the Carnegie. Actually, it's more than senior fellow now, isn't it? <laughs> but you're heading it. Oh, yeah. Yes, okay, so uh, s some updates here. To the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in DC and has been um, a really avid, uh, but also just really um, enlightening columnist in the run up to these elections. Just yesterday I read uh, Milan's piece on the dawn of India's fourth party system, which I thought was really nice and gave me a new way of understanding these elections and what lies ahead. So hopefully he'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, Next, we will, Ashu, are you next? You haven't listed yourself in the order of uh, proceedings on your own. I, I think I was going second. Oh, you're going second, okay. Second, after, after third, is that okay? 
Okay, so third is Professor Varshney, who should need uh, no introduction. Uh, he is our head honcho here at the Center for Contemporary South Asian Studies. Uh, he's also the Saul Goldman Professor of International Studies. And his research, um, I'm sure many of you have read his really important book on ethnic conflict and civic life in India. Uh, in addition, his first book, also very interesting, was on uh, the political economy of India's development. Uh, and he has continued to research these topics as well as write as a columnist for the Indian Express over the last few years and is working now on a project on populism and nationalism and the intersection or independence of these um, in contemporary India. And finally, we will have Sarah Khan, whose book, I hope, will be the subject of a book adda in the not too distant future. And uh, Sarah is lecturer convertible to assistant professor of political science at Yale and works on gender and comparative politics with the regional specialization in South Asia. And she studies in particular, I think, the critical but understudied topic of gender gaps in political preferences and the barriers that continue uh, to plague women's uh, participation in South Asia uh, with implications for beyond. So uh, Professor Chibber uh, will start by speaking on why Modi won. Uh, next, Milan will speak on the emergence of the fourth party system. Ashu will speak on the implication of Modi's uh, victory for democracy in the Indian nation. And Sarah will bring uh, comparative politics insights uh, in terms of learning from our neighbors, in particular uh, Pakistan, which is the main empirical site of her study. So I will, with no further ado, bring Professor Chibber. Thank you, Prerna. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the Institute, to the Center for Contemporary South Asia. Thanks to Grace and to Stephanie for hosting me and taking care of all my little demands as I fluctuated. You know, my mind was deciding what to do. And so thank you all of you for coming. I just want to start by saying that we live in both terrifying and exhilarating times. And now you may wonder why. It sounds like a cliche. but. As an academic, these times are exhilarating because things are happening we frankly don't understand. And if you can sit back and watch, you can watch, ask with amazement, why is this happening? What's going on here? I don't understand it. And I think to me, as an academic, that's a really exciting moment, watching from a distance. But at the same time, these are absolutely terrifying moments because you could actually be caught in the middle of one of these debates and wars and these political battles, and it's absolutely terrifying to be on one side of them right now. So I think it's both exhilarating and terrifying. It's terrifying in the following sense as well, that if you are in India and you know, you've had this society that's been kind of muddling along, and just think about it, it's not only India but many parts of the world, along comes a leader, along comes the power of the state, and suddenly opinions and people quickly fall into two camps. Either you're for it or you're against it, and the middle ground is gone. Now, that's an empirical observation. What's really fascinating to me is how quickly that happens. How to me, as an intellectual, it's really amazing to see why does it happen so quickly? What's going on? How is it that these people's attitudes and opinions that have been existing for some time can suddenly be broken into two? And this is happening not only in India, but it's happening in many parts of the world. So when I approach this talk today on why Modi won, what I'm going to do on the one hand is give you some data cruncher. So you're going to see lots of pictures and graphs and data, right? And again, you're going to get bored and your eyes are going to glaze over. But I'm going to raise three questions to which we don't have an answer. And I want to see what your collective opinion is on what's going on. And I'll get to those in a minute. And what I really want to say is that some of these things that are happening in India are actually, from the data, are completely befuddling to us political scientists. And maybe we need to ask ourselves. And in fact, I often tell people that what's shocking to me, and it's not only shocking to me, by the way, it's shocking to the BJP as well. They, they won so handily. They were not expecting it either. Is that it's a failure as to why we couldn't see this coming, why we couldn't see these patterns coming. And maybe we are, as Hegel famously said, the owl of Minerva begins its flight at dusk. Right? Maybe that's what we are condemned to be, living in darkness forever. But having said, with those happy thoughts, let me proceed. <laughs> right? So what is the BJP's victory, and is it a new social coalition? Okay, 
Let's begin by what happened in 2019. And this is just an important to set the facts on the ground. I was asked to do this, so set the tone for it. As you can see, the BJP contested slightly more seats in 2019 than it did in 2014. It won 303 seats. Its vote share increased by almost 6.5 percent. And it won 224 seats with more than 50 percent of the vote. That's an overwhelming victory in the Indian context. And the median margin of victory in the seats it won was almost 20 percent. Right? So in other words, this was a thumping we had not, nobody had seen. This was a thumping of the opposition that nobody had seen. Now, of course, this is an election. And you can take cold comfort in what this Indian analyst, Yogendra Yadav, said. He said, you know, there's a long race, and an election is just a snapshot. At some point, somebody is ahead. Who is ahead five years later, nobody knows. But, you know, you can take cold comfort in that. But the fact is that this is what happened in this election. And the question we need to ask ourselves, I'm going to try and give some answers to it as to why this happened. Sorry. OK. There are short-term factors for explaining this. You know, these are arguments everybody knows. One is the popularity of the leader. Of course, we need to ask ourselves, why is leadership so important? But that's a separate conversation, which I won't go into. There's also the question of resources. And I think Milan will talk much more about it which is the extent to which the BJP had an overwhelming advantage in terms of the resources it garnered, and um, it had for the election. And in fact, when we were interviewing Rahul Gandhi, he said, I wasn't only fighting the BJP, I was fighting an entire machinery, both media and money and political power expressed in very you know, um, raw terms, which the Congress was up against. There's also, of course, the fact that the opposition was remarkably weak. These are all short-term factors. But there are two short-term factors which I want to dwell on a little bit once I get to the talk. One is Pulwama, which is this episode which, uh, in which um, there was a suicide bombing that killed many officers of the Central Reserve Police Force. And according to lots of narrative, it swung the election. And I, as in good, since this is not an academic talk, it is, but I have only 15 minutes, I'm going to want you to hold on to the suspense as to why I think that Pulwama is interesting and important. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And finally, government performance, right? Now, this is, one, this is a controversial topic. And you quickly realize that even something like government performance takes on ideological tones very, very quickly. Did the government perform well, or did it perform poorly, right? And we're going to talk about what government performance means and to what extent we think this has something to do with the performance of the BJP. Then there are other structural factors, which are long-term factors that explain the success of the BJP. There's a fourth party system, which you know, Milan is going to talk at length about and has and written an excellent report, which you will hear, for, hear of and hear from shortly. The idea was introduced by Paul Shikar. And in ideology and identity, the book printer referred, we attribute this to the role of ideology. And the question I'm going to be asking in this talk is, does the 2019 election offer any new insights? What do we learn from the 2019 election about these long-term structural forces? Yes, the answer, short answer is yes, there are new things happening. Right? For details, you have to see the paper, right? You have to you know, go read the real thing. It's only 7,000 words, so a little more, more data. But the bottom line is there's a rise of the new middle classes. And the rise of these new middle classes has actually, I think, had a significant impact on the outcome of this election. Why it's had the impact it has, we don't know. That's the other third we don't know. So the three we don't know are Pulwama, performance, and what's happening with the new middle classes. That's something I'm going to talk about briefly. So let's begin. The plan for the talk is very simple. We've talked about the BJP's political dominance. I'm going to talk about the role of ideology briefly, go over short-term factors, talk about a new coalition that supports the BJP. The BJP, to be blunt, has emerged as a catch-all party of all Hindus. Right? That's it. Minorities don't vote for it. Religious minorities don't. It is a catch-all party for all Hindus. There's a new middle class, and there's a dominance of an idea of political majoritarianism, which is something I'll talk about and conclude with where next. So the main contributions are three. First, the BJP's new social coalition is significantly different than its traditional base. And I'll show you data as to why that is the case. And there's an emerging idea for political majoritarianism that is somewhat distinct from the impact of religiosity and Hindu nationalism. The BJP is traditionally associated as a party representing the religious interests of the Hindus and the idea of Hindu nationalism. The book deals with that in more detail. And this influence of political majoritarianism is especially true among the middle classes, 
largely because of something DL shared called the secularization of caste. This is an inside the ballpark joke for people who know Indian, uh, who study Indian political science more than anybody else. Okay, so what is it? Uh, let me not talk about this. Is a very limited time. Let me get to what's happening. Won't talk about ideology at the moment. Let me talk about what's happening with the BJP. First, on the ground, things are changing, and they're changing in significant ways. There is greater party identification with the BJP. So the national election studies, all of this data is based on the national, national election studies from 1971 to 2019. And the argument is pretty simple. The national election studies have always asked people, which party do you feel close to? And if you look in 1971, the average in India is about 33%. And that number hasn't changed very much. About a third of the respondents say they feel close to a party. In 1971, 63% said, of the 33% said they felt close to the Congress party. That number is now 18%. In 1971, 5% said they felt close to the Jansang. And now it's 41% who identify with the BJP, among those who feel close to a political party. So on the ground, the BJP has support. And the reason these identification is important, because these are the people who will go out and mobilize votes for you. These are the people who are your ground troops. These are people who are your activists. These are people who you can turn to to actually rely on in times of uh, you know, electoral uncertainty. So that's a pretty big and dramatic shift. The other thing that's happened, which I want to talk about briefly, is the impact of government policy. And I'm not going to discuss much about the impact of Modi or resources, because you know that's resources. Milan knows a lot more, and he'll talk about it, perhaps. And you know, Modi is you know, it's interesting, but not that intellectually interesting. Let me talk briefly about something called Ujwala. Ujwala is a scheme the government of India came up with to actually give cooking gas to people. Okay. And there's a reason Ujwala poses an interesting problem. If you look at this data, the data shows how many people own liquefied petroleum gas. In 1999, the number was 19%. In 1951, it was, in 1924, it was 51%. That number had jumped up dramatically in 2019 to 79%. Yeah. Five minutes. OK, I'm going to move even faster. OK, so the question is, what's going on here? So let me pose a puzzle to you. And the puzzle I'm going to pose to you is the Modi government, for good or bad, has been successful at trying to make sure that some of these minor inconveniences that people face are addressed directly. And they're addressing it directly. The PM holds regular meetings with state level bureaucrats to make sure these things happen. And the question is, there, he's doing that. And the question is, why is that having an imp such a large impact on people's attitudes? Is the removal of state, to pose the question quite directly, can, if the state removes daily inconveniences for people and a few daily inconveniences, is that enough to support the government no matter what other policies it undertakes? I think that's a deep question to which I don't have an answer. That's the first question. The second question is, Pulwama. And I'll just talk about the three questions since I have only five minutes. This is question is, oh, sorry, I'm going to move. This was about the messaging of the government, which is that unlike previous governments, if you ask people in the survey which government is responsible for actually producing the welfare policies, often most Indian citizens couldn't identify which government. With the BJP, identification is clear. They have a great messaging which says it is the central government that's actually doing it. So it's not only that you're getting the benefit, but we are actually delivering it. So you know that's, the messaging goes along with the content in some senses. This, to me, is the much more interesting slide. I just want you to look at it and think about it. So this is the Mood of the Nation survey conducted by Lok Niti in blue or in purple in 2018. The pre-poll is conducted in March 2019 after Pulwama. Okay. People are asked, are your, is your income insufficient to meet your needs? The number in 1900 in 2018 was 67%. Post Pulwama, that number had dropped to 51%. We know that the economic conditions on the ground did not change. And this is true for difficult to find a job. This is difficult. This is true for dissatisfaction of the performance of the NDA government. And this is true for has the Modi government failed in bringing a check in? Everything drops. Two simple answers. One is, surveys are pathetically poor at measuring these things. That's one answer, right? This is, after all, a survey, so come on, what's going on? That's one answer. And we can talk about that. The other is, the much more 
the much more serious question. And the much more serious question is, are people willing to change their opinions on their economic well-being based on some extra economic concerns or some cultural concerns? I don't have an idea. I don't know what political science says about it, but those are the only two possible interpretations for this, for this data. Because there's no reason why post Pulvama you should see such a short, sharp drop in appraisal of the government's economic form, in the appraisal of the government's economic performance. So I think those are the short-term factors we need to think about. Let me now talk very briefly about, since I have a few minutes, about what's going on here. And I just want to show to you what we do is we divide the sample for those of you who care into people who are traditional BJP voters and people who are new BJP voters and people who've never voted for the BJP. 54% of the sample has never voted for BJP and may never vote for the BJP. So there's still a BJP is still a plurality majority party, not a majority majority party, which is, we know that. I just want you to look at these figures and I'm going to go through them very quickly. This is the all voters. This is the second one is who are the traditional BJP voters. And these are the new BJP voters in 2014. And these are the new BJP voters in 2019. The same pattern will appear in all. So when you're looking at these, contrast all voters with the traditional BJP voters with the new voters. And what you find is that if you look at this particular graph, you realize that the new BJP voter, old BJP voter, mostly upper caste and OBC, new BJP voter, more Dalit. And you find the same thing is happening for class. You find the same thing is happening for gender bias. The BJP's gender bias has gone among the new voters. And you also realize that the younger people are now voting for the BJP in much, much larger numbers. In other words, traditional BJP voter is much older, newer BJP voter is much younger. So there's been a gradual transformation in some senses in who votes for the BJP. And we're moving away from the old traditional upper caste, upper class basis and moving to a much more catch-all Hindu party, right? One more minute, okay. What is going on here? And the answer is pretty simple. The answer is there's a rise of a middle class, and I'm not going to show you the data, but there it is. People have more assets, people are more educated, right? And what's happening is the following, that the BJP is particularly playing this game called political majoritarianism, I would argue, and they're making this, they're delinking it from Hindu nationalism. I can answer the questions in a detail. <laughs> The logic they use was na tereskrit karenge, na puraskrit karenge, na bhaiskrit karenge. We will neither abominate nor reward nor ostracize. And I have these, those little exclamation points of mine, right? I don't think that was in their slogan, right? And what I'm going to say is that these ideas are actually bought in by the Hindu middle classes. And this idea is somewhat and subtly distinct from Hindu nationalism, which we can talk about. And I think it's only different from Hindu nationalism if you're not a religious minority. If you're a religious minority, the differences are not are non-existent because on the ground it really doesn't matter. But with, for among within the Hindu community, this plays out in very very different ways, and we can discuss that. And I just want to conclude by showing that when you look at this data, which I won't have time to go into, essentially what we are finding is that the post-Modi BJP voters are more likely to buy into the political majoritarianism idea, especially among the newer middle classes, right? The high socioeconomic, the upper caste, upper class people are still Hindu nationalists, but the way they're mobilizing support among the newer groups is through this idea, through the new middle classes, is through this idea of political majoritarianism. The question is, why is it that the middle class is buying into this, right? So the conclusion is, Four simple questions. Is the promise of greater efficiency in state delivery sufficient to ignore the pre prejudices and policy failures of a government? Right, that's the first question because of, you know, the gas effect. Second, can people forego their economic concerns in the short run for some greater cultural good? The Pulvama effect. Third, why is this middle class moved by majoritarianism? And the fourth question, which I leave open for conversation afterwards, how soft is the BJP support? And some of us believe it's quite soft. Others believe it's not. So I'm going to stop there and take questions.
Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to Ashu and Prerna and to Brown for having me. It's always uh, fun to come back. Ashu always promises an intellectual feast when he comes, and he also gives us a literal feast after we're done. So um, it's always fun to be here for, for both of those. Uh, what I've been asked to talk about today is what the implications of this election are for the party system uh, in India. And for those of you who have been uh, following India, uh, there is a well-known framework with which we use which we try to understand the evolution of Indian politics. Um, there's broad consensus that the post-47 history of India can roughly be divided, politically divided, into three phases. This is a framework that's been put forward by Yogendra Yadav and Suhas Palshikar. Uh, the first phase roughly goes from 1952 to 1967. This is the era of Congress dominance, when it built off this reservoir of goodwill that it inherited as being the party that won India her independence. It was not only the most important political party, it was arguably the most important political institution in town. While you had an opposition, it was very fragmented. Uh, as Pradeep and Rahul would point out in their book, a lot of the major ideological debates at the time happened not between the Congress and the opposition, but often within the Congress itself. And you can see here that uh, it, they regularly got a, a above 45% uh, of the popular vote, uh, ruled most of India's states. And the first column is the effective number of parties. I'm sure most of you know what that is, but it's essentially saying let's weigh parties by the actual number of seats that they win. So a party that wins, say, 100 seats is given more weight than a party that wins, say, five seats, right? These two are an equivalent. So the effective number of parties is around 1.8. Second phase is between 1967 and 1989. In 67, the Congress suffers a series of pretty debilitating losses at the state level, but manages to retain control over the national government in Delhi and does so through the entire period, except for that brief period following the end of the emergency uh, when they're thrown out, uh, uh, and Mrs. Gandhi's thrown out, but then she comes back in 1980 and continues, they continue in power to 1989. And you can see that the Congress grip on states declines, there's greater party competition, the Congress vote drips, and then 1989, the bottom falls out, right? This is the end of the sort of Congress hegemony. We see a period of coalition politics in Delhi between 1989 and 2014 when you can see a massive increase in uh, partisan competition, uh, a real decline in the Congress, not just nationally, uh, but at the state level. One of the questions that political scientists have been grappling with is, what does the 2014 election mean? And now, what does the 2019 election mean? This is a map of India's parliamentary constituencies where you could see the saffronization take place, right? I mean, the ways in which those blotches of orange which represent the BJP have spread outside of the BJP's traditional catchment areas into literally all four corners of the country, right? North, south, east, west. After 2014, when, as Pradeep showed you the data, the Congress won its first single, uh, the BJP won its first single party majority, there were three reactions of political scientists. One is this is a black swan election. You basically get a perfect storm of anti-incumbency, a sagging economy, a charismatic politician, uh, and the BJP got 31% of the vote, and they managed to manufacture a majority. Then you had political scientists who, op uh, who, who offered exactly the opposite conclusion, that this is an epochal sort of shift, that this has been an earthquake, uh, not just uh, a black swan of, uh, event. And then you had people like me who were in the middle, which said, this could be something big, you know, classic hedging, right? You're not really sure. It could be big, but it's only one data point, so, so what do you do about it? Uh, I'd like to submit that we are now firmly in uh, a new fourth party system. And what I want to spend my time doing is walking through what the principles of the third party system have been in India to show you that on each one of these core principles, India today politically looks very different. The third party system was characterized by the following six things. There was an absence of a central pole in national politics, no one pan-Indian party that could dominate politics. You saw increasing regional fragmentation. You saw intensifying political competition. You saw a federalization of national elections. So national elections became something akin to a collection of state level verdicts that aggregated at the national level. You saw heightened voter mobilization at the state level relative to the national level which is indicative of the fact that states became the primary venues for political contestation, not New Delhi. And finally, you saw a shift in the way that caste was mobilized. 
uh, away from jati, this kind of individual caste uh, uh, groups, to the larger umbrella categories of OBCs and Dalits, or uh, what I call the Varna categories. And we'll talk about each of these as quickly as I can before Prerna gives me the signal that I'm out of time. Okay, absence of a central poll. We know between 1989 and 2014 there was no single party that could dominate or saturate political space. This is the vote share in national elections of regional parties, the Congress in blue and the BJP. And for about six election cycles, there was a very clear rule of thumb, which is that the national parties get around 50% of the vote if you add up the Congress and the BJP, and the regional parties, which is everybody else, gets another 50%. Uh, in 2014, we start to see that break down, but very clearly break down in 2019. In 2019, the share of votes going to regional parties went down to around 43%. It was about 48% in 2014, so the cracks started appearing, and that ceiling was sort of broken in, in 2019. We now have a sort of dominant party that we could say nationally has filled that vacuum that the Congress once used to have back when it was the dominant party. Now. If you just focus on the national level, though, you are not paying attention to what is happening beneath the national level, um, which is that the BJP has been steadily improving its fortunes at the state level as well. It's, it's hard for us now to remember that prior to winning the general election in 2014, the BJP only controlled five states uh, in the, of the Indian Union, right? Today they control uh, 12 and their allies control another six. Um, so you can see a huge shift in the balance of power that's going on in India state assemblies. For the first time, as of a couple of years ago, I think two years ago, uh, the BJP now has more MLAs or state assembly uh, persons uh, than the Congress party. That had never happened before. And one of the implications of this, of course, is that the BJP is on its way to achieving a majority in the upper house of parliament. When it won that majority in 2014, it won it in the lower house. The upper house changes much more slowly because that's indirectly elected by the state assemblies. So the only way to change the composition of the upper house is you have to keep winning state elections. And because of the BJP success, uh, they have finally for the first time surpassed the Congress in terms of having uh, more, uh, more seats. Uh, by current numbers, the BJP alliance, the NDA, is about 12 seats short of an outright majority in the upper house, which means if they do well in upcoming state assembly elections in states like Haryana, Maharashtra, Jharkhand, they could by 2021 achieve that majority, which is a big deal because then you can more swiftly, more easily push through legislation through parliament where you need both uh, the assent of both houses. Increasing political fragmentation. Uh, so here there's been a clear trend that during the dominant party era, uh, the effective number of parties uh, was between uh, one and a half and, and two and a half. We saw a huge explosion in the effective number of parties post-1989 when India entered the coalition era. Uh, in 2004, in, there were effectively six and a half parties represented in parliament. Uh, that has come down now to just three, okay, in 2019. So that's a remarkable shift uh, in, a, in just a decade. Uh, intensifying political competition. So we have seen, beginning from the post-emergency election in 1977, a pretty steady decline in the average margins of victory of uh, Lok Sabha races. So that's the, that's the difference between the winner and the runner-up. Um, by 2009, India's elections had become the most competitive that they had ever been. The average margin of victory uh, was under 10%. What we're seeing now is actually elections are becoming less competitive. We're seeing the average margins of victory go up. It was 17% in 2019. It's even bigger if you look at Pradeep's data, which shows you the seats the BJP won. Now, by comparative standards, this is still pretty competitive. The average margin of victory in a US House race is about 35%. Um, so it's quite a difference. But for India, this has been a doubling in the margins, uh, again, in, in, in just a decade. Uh, federalization of national elections. There have been four tenets of the nature of the relationship between the national political level and the states. Number one is that political competition in each, uh, national political competition was a reflection of the dynamics associated with state politics. State politics sets the menu for what national po political competition looks like in a state. The degree of participation in a national election is largely correlated with the degree of participation in a state election. And then there are two others. Uh, one is that national elections are influenced by state-level state political calendars. And the performance of state governments, 
was an important determinant of how voters voted in national elections in addition to state elections. I would submit that the first two are largely unchained. We haven't seen much difference there, but we are seeing differences on the last two. Uh, this is a data from the three states which had assembly elections right before the national polls, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, and Madhya Pradesh. And what you could see is that the last the first three election cycles, whoever won that assembly election in that state replicated their performance in the national election, which was just held about five or six months later. For the first time in recent memory, we're actually seeing a decoupling of the state and national calendars. The Congress won all three of these states, uh, took them all back from the BJP in January of 2019. And just a few months later, uh, they were tossed out. I mean. In Rajasthan, for instance, they won not a single parliamentary seat after having uh, formed the government uh, a few months later, a few months earlier. Uh, so in 2014, 2019, <laughs> national level factors appear to have trumped state level ones. One other data point, uh, which, which is uh, in accordance with Pradeep showed you, is that the issue of jobs, people's economic concerns, actually declined as the campaign went on. Uh, so if you ask people in March of 2018, 21% uh, of Indians said that the issue of joblessness was the greatest concern to them. That declined by almost 10 percentage points within just a couple of months, right? People were focused on Pawama, they were focused on Modi, they were focused on other things. And ironically, even though they may have had economic grievances, they saw the prime minister as the person best situated to deal with them. Uh, Voter turnout patterns have also been changing. Um, the bars here show you what state turnout looks like, and the red is what national level looks like. And what you see is that national turnout had historically always been higher than state turnout. In the third party system, that starts to switch. People are much more active in state elections than the national elections, and now there's been much more of a convergence. So there was a 10 percentage point difference between state turnout and national turnout in the mid 2000s, and that's just a couple of percentage points. Uh, today. Finally, the shifting mobilization of caste identity and the third party system, these individual jatis lost their salience as the debate in the wake of the Mundal Commission and the agitation around Mundal focused on the umbrella categories of OBC and Dalit. What we're seeing now is actually a throwback to the old distinction that people are making between jatis but with a twist. This is data from Uttar Pradesh, again from the CSDS survey, and what you see here is that the BJP has essentially taken those larger groups of OBC and Dalit and driven a wedge between the dominant Jatis, the Yadavs and the Jatavs, and the lower OBCs and the lower Dalits. And it's done that in many states, this is just data from Bihar, and that has been, um, this is data from UP, data from Bihar looks very similar, has been extraordinarily uh, impactful for the party. Okay. Uh, let me just end here by talking about the other foundations of the BJP's power. So this, these are ways in which the, the, the six tenets of the third party system have been violated. What are the foundations of the BJP's power? One is that the BJP today is the system defining party. Just as elections were fought in favor of Indira Gandhi or in favor of the Congress or in opposition to, this is precisely how state and national <laughs> politics are being talked about today. Number two, and I think we'll get into this uh, in the discussion, is that the BJP now has captured something akin to ideological hegemony. This is what Paul Schicker disaggregates into two things. One is a new nationalism, and the second is a new developmentalism. And both of these uh, core precepts have meant that there is very little room for the Congress and the opposition to maneuver. Uh, the BJP has sort of saturated the space. They have created a real political machine with a massive financial backing. The corporate donations that we know about, much forget about the ones we don't know about, were 20 to 1 in favor of the BJP this last election. Uh, and of course, the question of charismatic leadership. Uh, let me just, I'll just end quickly here by, what are the four potential threats to this dominance? And I'm sure we'll talk about this more. One is clearly the economic story, which is actually more bad news upon more bad news if you open up the Indian business papers, this concern about jobless growth. Number two is the contradiction between who is voting for the BJP, as Pradeepa showed you, and who their representatives are, which still look a lot like the old BJP, uh, much less representative of the lower caste of the OBCs. The intergenerational change in social attitudes is a fancy way of saying, are young people going to buy into this, these ideas of majoritarianism and nationalism? 
And the last is, has, can the BJP continue relying on its ability to, you, to so efficiently translate votes, again, far short of a majority in terms of votes, into a majority uh, of seats? So I think we'll probably talk about several, several of these things in the, in the discussion, but um, thanks very much. My 15 minutes, uh, the title is uh, Continuing Electoral Resilience and Mounting Liberal Deficits. And this uh, paradox emerges from uh, seeing the 2019 elections and what has happened since then, not just elections, um, in the framework of democratic theory. Okay, so this is based on a forthcoming article in Journal Democracy. It should appear in three weeks. And the argument is that 2019 elections and developments since then demonstrate that India's democratic evolution has reached, can you hear me? Has reached a stage where the electoral and liberal aspects of democracy are progressively in conflict. India's electoral vibrancy is not in doubt, but the liberalism of its polity is in precipitous decline. While the liberal deficits have always been there, and I'll give you uh, some new data on that, um, they're now approaching critical proportions. And if not checked, India is threatening to become an illiberal or an ethnic democracy, terms I shall explain uh, a little later. Um, so just, uh, we can't go into the details of democratic theory, modern democratic theory, just to, to, to suffice, uh, to, to briefly summarize, there's a minimum requirement, which is electoral, and there's a broader requirement of democracy. The minimum requirement is, elect, uh, um, is con free contestation of the incumbent, which presumably has all the powers, powers of the police, powers of the bureaucracy, etc. So incumbent of the government of the day, and uh, participation um, uh, in, by, the, by the citizenry in elections. That's Robert Dahl's famous, famous X and Y axes. <clears throat> a broader requirement, a lot of political theorists, I'm not citing them all here. I've been uh, reading them all, reading a lot of them over my, uh, my um, sabbatical last year. There are at least three liberal freedoms which are common to the idea of liberalism in democratic theory. Three, at least three. You can expand that, but three are common across. One is freedom of expression, second is freedom of, freedom of religious practice, and third is freedom of association. Um, a freedom of association is typically not only about uh, how free are political parties to form and contest, but also civil society. How free are non-party organizations, free to, to organize themselves and free to contest the, the powers that be. Freedom of expression and freedom of religious practice are quite obvious. <clears throat> Um, the older version of liberalism under John Stuart Mill would have also included freedom, uh, its right to property, freedom of uh, property ownership. That in the modern versions of, of liberalism is no longer a requirement uh, according to many, though according to some it remains a requirement. Um, electoral vibrancy of India. Since 1952, you heard 17 national elections. You didn't hear, but you should know, 372 state elections. Three million local legislators, at least one-third women, at least one-third, in some states, half. Bihar, half. Um, since 1992-93, all three levels are elected now. Freedom of contestation, power has changed hand eight times in Delhi. Change, uh, if incumbents change freely, that shows freedom of contestation, according to Dahl's famous criterion. Hmm? that the incumbents, the government in power today cannot suddenly say, we cancel elections. Hmm? Election results, right? And participation turnouts by now routinely in excess of 60%. The last two elections, 2014 and 2019, had the highest turnout since 1952. Mr. Modi has won two of the most, <coughs> quote-unquote, participatory elections. 
<clears throat> more than uh, any other um, politicians in India. Now, the liberal deficits idea, I said, is about three, these three freedoms, uh, which are especially important for democracy between elections. We can talk about it, why this claim is made. But India's record on these freedoms is not as strong as its electoral record, and this is especially true at the present time. But here is uh, now by what has come to be seen as um, a widely accepted, or I hope so, I don't know, I've written this up in a paper, this is uh, the new data set that has emerged from WeDem. It is fast replacing Freedom House data sets and some other data sets on democracy. It's not unquestionably, it's not perfect, no data set is perfect. All measurement is error, we know that. But this is now uh, widely accepted as the biggest data set. So right since 1950, the blue line is the electoral democracy line, and the red line is liberal democracy line. There's always been a gap. And we can discuss why. And the first constitutional amendment has something to do with it. First constitutional amendment put constraints on India's civil liberties and put them and enshrined them in the constitution, even under Nehru, right? We might want to get into that if, you, if, you, if, if, you, if you're interested. But I, don't, I couldn't put together this morning the, the data after uh, until 89. This gap is now very large in the last four years. It's here like this, it is becoming something like this here. This gap is very large between the electoral and the liberal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the liberal democracy index here is created on the basis of political theory, which is one of the most interesting aspects of VDEM data set. It has three other ways of, of measuring democracy. They are very, strict, very, uh, very strictly following political theory, which those who are very statistically inclined in political science do not normally do. Some do, most do not. Most do not follow political theory while measuring. Okay, so BJP, um, um, next two slides are on India's changing political logic. You saw some versions of it, or, or the, the Vaishnav version and the Chibba version of it. Here's my version. BJP governments have always, they've been there for a long time now, have always worked under three imperatives. The ideological imperative, which says India is a primarily Hindu nation and minorities are secondary. That's what Hindu nationalism in one sentence means. Two, an electoral um, uh, imperative. For winning elections, you have to put together coalitions and political pragmatism often takes over. Hmm? Now you cannot win elections only on the basis of ideology. Has been a standard understanding of Indian electoral politics. Third, constitutional. Governments swear to uphold the constitution. And the constitution says that India is owned equally by all religious and other communities also linguistic and you know, all communities of India. Constitutionally, Hindu majority has no special legal or political privileges. That is the new term that some of us are beginning to use, the constitutional scholars and political scientists like me, I'm not a constitutional scholar, but I talk a lot to them. It's, it, it can be called now the constitutional settlement of 1950. Hmm? A constitutional, the constitutional settlement of 1950. Three and two, electoral and constitution previously constrained one, ideological, ideological uh, uh, rectitude or ideological uh, fervor. Therefore, my prediction after 2014 elections was that Modi would most probably be pushed towards the center. This is a claim made in a JOD article, General, General Democracy article, October of that, five years ago, and October of this year, the, this year's elections would be analyzed in, the, in, the, in JOD. And I viewed a right-wing shift as a low probability outcome. Instead, the low probability outcome, a rightward shift, has come about. Alignment of the electoral and the ideological has taken place. Hmm? The electoral was generating electro moderation earlier, ideological moderation, but this alignment is, is not taking place. BJP does not have a single Muslim MP. Lynchings are replacing riots as a form of anti-Muslim violence, distinctly up after 2014, not forthrightly and unambiguously condemned by the party in power. 2019 campaign, unlike 2014, had a distinctly Hindu nationalist rhetoric. You could argue 2014 had, a, uh, the, the Hindu nationalism there was subterranean, but this was open this time. It was explicit this time. Only 8% Muslims voted for BJP in 2019, as in 2014, yet BJP won. That is to say, Muslim electoral irrelevance 
and Hindu consolidation, this is a very big point, I hope we'll discuss it, are, are two sides of the same political coin. The basic idea is that if Hindu society is cleaved across caste lines, if castes are more important than, than belief in Hinduism, then you can, then Muslims will be a very significant electoral force in Indian politics as they have been. If caste, if, if you become, if you create a cross caste umbrella, if Hindu consolidation takes place, Hindu, Hindus are 80% of India, Muslims are 14%, then Muslim political irrelevance can be assumed and this is what's beginning to happen. Polit potential shortcuts uh, uh, to short run checks, sorry, not shortcut, pot potential short run cuts, uh, short run checks. Um, in principle, number three, third imperative, the constitutional check exercised by the court is the put biggest potential obstacle to the forward march of Hindu nationalism. How courts interpret their tasks now is vitally important. All of the uh, uh, recent laws are, have been challenged in court, where Article 370, the law about um, Unlawful Pre uh, Activities Prevention Act, Article 35A, habeas corpus in Kashmir, all are in the court. Some are being going to be heard and some dates have not been set yet. Second, federalism could be another check on Hindu majoritarianism if state elections in the coming months and years go against the BJP, which is not impossible. Third, serious economic crisis has already been talked about. If Hindu nationalism is unchecked, liberals, minorities, and civil society are seriously at risk. Hmm? Long-term predictions, this is a short-run issue over the next five, uh, five to seven years, but I think next five years. Long-term predictions are hard to make. Democracy is fundamentally open-ended, unless, of course, Hindu nationalism becomes hegemonic in a Gramscian as well as legal sense, displacing the constitutional settlement of 1950. Hmm? Now, uh, this data you, you, I think you've already seen. I don't need to do this. Essentially, 44% of Hindu community voted for BJP. That amounts to 36% of the overall vote of BJP. BJP got 37.4, only 1.4% of BJP's vote is non-Hindu. Only 1.4. 36 out, 36% out of 37.4 is Hindu vote. That's equal to 44% of Hindu vote in turn. Because Hindus are about 80% of India. Beleaguered liberalism, preventive detention, new law about who's a terrorist. I just don't think I, Prerna will let me speak about this. Beleaguered Muslim majority. Do you think it's a democracy? Sorry? <laughs> democracy with checks, not yeah. Trump's democracy. Yeah. <laughs> Beleaguered liberalism, I don't think I'll have, uh, I'll, I can talk about this. This is essentially the argument about return of, a serious return of preventive detention. Very serious return of preventive detention. Uh, Amartya Sen spoke very effectively and, and uh, about this on NDTV about three weeks ago, um, return of preventive detention. Second, beleaguered Muslim minority, only one thing I need to read for you, the ostensible, riots have disappeared, they're replaced by lynchings. The ostensible aim of lynchings is to prevent three things, the eating of beef and production, beef, uh, eating of beef and beef production, and selling of cow meat, premised on the claim that cows are sacred to Hindus, Hindu conversion to Islam, premise on the claim that such conversion is always promoted by coercion, deceit, or material temptation. Third, attempts of young Muslim men to marry Hindu women or their romantic entanglements, even if voluntary. Premise on the claim that these are aimed at increasing the size of Muslim population, which if not stopped now, would eventually overwhelm the Hindu population. This is a trope in Hindu national discourse, has been there since 1952 since 1950 when the party was born. Now, um, hard to escape the impression, one minute on this before we go, hard to escape the impression that the fundamental aim of lynchings is the production of a political order which establishes Hindu primacy and reduces Muslims to the status of secondary citizens. That is why vigilante groups not only catch suspected Muslims and perpetrate group violence on them, but they also force them to chant religious Hindu slogans such as Jai Shri Ram. If you just wanted to punish routine criminality, there was no need to force your victims to say victory to Lord Ram. If it's simply a question of punishment of routine criminality. 
Kashmir, I can say a lot. There is a lot here, as you can see. Uh, I've written a column on this uh, at length about the legally embedded political amorphosis. But let me conclude, because uh, Prerna would say only one minute left. If Hindu majoritarianism pushing itself electorally goes unchecked, if liberal freedoms are more curtailed than before, if minorities become more beleaguered in the coming years, the longest lasting democracy of the global south will be fundamentally transformed from a substantially liberal democracy, not an entirely liberal democracy. There is a gap there, right? Okay. Substantially liberal nonetheless, despite that gap, to an illiberal majoritarian democracy, also called ethnic democracy in some political science quarters. And examples are Malaysia since 1971, Israel, Sri Lanka uh, since 1956, and the US before 1965. Those are examples in the political science literature about ethnic, these were all democratic, but they were ethnic democracies. Na na that is to say, some part of the community, some minority community was disenfranchised or substantially disenfranchised <coughs> or did not have equal rights to citizenship. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much to the center for having me here. I was here about um, a year ago to talk about the Pakistani election. And so um, it's a pleasure to be back and um, to follow uh, these really great presentations. So um, when I was invited to speak, I was asked to talk about the view of the Indian election from Pakistan. Um, and prior to uh, the BJP's victory, uh, the, pr the Prime Minister of Pakistan, um, Imran Khan, uh, made a statement saying that under a Modi government, it may be more possible to resolve the Kashmir issue. Um, so here we are, you know. Um, so given, um, given that view of the election from, from Pakistan, um, what I'm going to do today uh, is a little bit different. What um, I'm going to focus my time on is talking about what we might learn from comparing elections in Pakistan and India, and um, if there's a comparative research agenda that we can build going forward, what are some of the things that we can compare fruitfully, and what are some of the things that really are so different um, that don't yield such fruitful comparisons? So um, to say a little bit about how and why comparisons might be valid. So at this point, Pakistan has had three consecutive um, quote unquote democratic elections with varying degrees of freedom of expression and participation. Um, at the same time, democratic consolidation remains very, in a very real way in question um, because of the particular logic of civil military relations in Pakistan, which is entirely different from India. So the idea of reserved domains of power that the military controls, um, the military administration of elections. So um, the most recent elections were some of the most highly securitized uh, in Pakistan and also military administration of the census of 2017, which was used to, um, which was used to create the electoral constituencies in which um, the 2018 election took place. Um, and then allegations of pre-poll rigging um, and partisan, uh, partisan judicial activism in the lead up to, uh, to 2018 uh, national election in Pakistan. These are some things that I think are unique and distinctive and make comparisons incredibly challenging. On the other hand, um, what, what some of this has meant and also what Pakistan's checkered past with um, transitions um, away from democracy, um, it's, it's led to the classification of uh, Pakistan as a hybrid regime, which is valid for a number of reasons, but I think it's potentially eluding some of the comparisons we can make about common trends in First, what, um, what I think uh, Ashu pointed to in his talk is this de declining space for the expression of preferences, which is an integral part of what constitutes a democracy um, under, the, uh, under some of our th uh, important theoretical conceptions. Um, another is uh, something that Millen pointed to, which is this shift from, from the national election being a regional verdict 
to being a national verdict. Um, and I'll, I'll show you patterns from Pakistan that are going to look familiar to uh, when you look at the, at, at the BJP's sweep in India. Um, I think another important thing that we can talk about is the implications that this has for federalism. Um, and then finally, voter behavior and the nature of identity politics um, and its importance for mobilization and how it's changed both in terms of substance and in terms of political strategy around the mobilization of um, voters on along identity lines. So I, I won't have time to speak about all of these, but I'll, I'll touch on some of them. So um, one of the things that was uh, important about the 2018 elections in Pakistan was the shift away from regional verdicts. So this is the electoral map of Pakistan in 2008. And um, this is the election that was, um, that was uh, the, the party that came into power was the Pakistan People's Party. You can see here that um, parties' uh, seats are very much concentrated along provincial lines. This, is, this looks very similar in 2013. Again, you have concentration of parties along provincial lines. What's really different in 2018 is that the PTI really makes um, inroads across the country. And so this idea of a shift away from a regional to a really national um, uh, mandate for a party is something that I think is a common trend for both India and Pakistan, and it has deep implications for the strategy of other parties. Um, and it raises important questions about how this is possible in the presence of really deep regional inequalities um, and differences um, uh, among the states in India and among the provinces in Pakistan. So uh, in terms of understanding this shift and how it happened, um, another question that Millen pointed to was also um, not just the extent to which a national election reflects, um, reflects a regional, um, regional gains by parties, but also the extent to which one lower level of elections, which is the state assembly elections in India and the provincial assembly elections in Pakistan, um, to what extent are those reflected then in the National Assembly returns? Um, and uh, as, as Milan showed us uh, very convincingly, this correlation has been changing in India. Now in Pakistan, this correlation has always been really, really strong. Um, in a survey uh, that I uh, conducted uh, along with others in Lahore uh, before the 2018 elections, 97 respondents, a uh, percent of respondents who said that they voted, uh, uh, who reported turning out to vote said that they report uh, they uh, voted for the same party for the national and provincial elections. Um, so this is uh, this is just showing you what that looks like. So these are the national assembly returns by party for Punjab, and then these are the provincial assembly returns, and the map looks very very similar. And this has been true in Pakistan for a really long time. And one of the reasons it's been true is because of timing. Um, national and provincial elections in Pakistan happen at the same time, which means that turnout is, by, is almost mechanically the same for provincial and national elections, which is very unlike India. Um, it's also the case that then there are coordinated campaign effects because campaigning is taking place in one round. Um, and I, I think the, the point, the broader point that this raises is that the institutions and the mechanics by which elections are run can actually have a really important effect. And so the comparison that we can make perhaps with the Indian case is that the potential for this delinking of national and uh, state election results is there in part because of the institutional design that they're held at separate times. Um, another, uh, another question that this shift raises uh, from regional to national level mandates in national elections is this question of whether a nationally oriented campaign strategy, which is often also nationalistic in its nature, is this what is producing, is this working and is that what is producing uh, these gains? Um, finally, how is it producing these gains? And I think here one question to ask is whether the increased public access to different types of media actually 
enables this kind of mass appeal messaging and um, allows for a new kind of national campaign strategy which wasn't as possible in the past. I don't know the answer to this, but this is an example of the kinds of questions we can ask when we observe parallel shifts in this direction. So I said a little bit of campaigns, and um, I think this is another issue where we can have a really interesting conversation on the on the compared on uh, through comparative analysis. So first of all, what we know about both India and Pakistan is that the cost of campaigning and the cost of an election is really, really increasing. And this is happening alongside a rise in the uh, uh, an increase in the size of a constituency. Um, one important question is, what does this mean for who can contest an election? And um, when these barriers to entry become high, what does it mean for the representativeness of candidates? Um, relatedly, and we can, I, I hope that we'll have a chance to talk with Milan about this in the Q&A, is what this means about designing institutions of campaign finance. And I think this is going to be one of the key things for both of these countries and something to follow. Um, another important trend in campaigns in both of these countries is increased access to really detailed information about voters, the rise of the meteoric rise of political consulting firms, um, and slower uh, to catch up in Pakistan, but the increase in political polling. Um, what implications does this have for party strategy? I think that we seek very clear examples of how this data is used by campaigns and parties um, in that there's a demand for it, they're willing to pay for it, but it's not clear to me how they're using it to actively target groups of voters. So I think this is an open question for, um, for both elections and for both countries. And another one is whether this um, increase in having information about voters and their opinions has any implications for what happens after the election in terms of informing what do parties do. Um, and we if we think about public opinion polling, it's actually really important in inter-electoral periods um, in the case, for instance, of the United States. Um, and what we've seen both in India and Pakistan is a rise in polling in pre-electoral periods and its use by candidates and parties to campaign, but not so much to govern. Um, and so this it'll be interesting to follow this and see what this rise of, um, of the generation of a lot of new public opinion data means for campaigns as well as for policymaking. Um, another uh, point that I wanted to bring up was what should the, what's the appropriate level of analysis and um, the dimension along which we make comparisons across India and Pakistan. So if we think about the national level, I think some of the potential for comparison becomes very difficult in part because of those national level features about Pakistan um, along the lines of civil military relations that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. When we get into subnational um, comparisons, one of the things that's challenging about looking across states and across provinces is that they're incredibly distinctive and unique. Um, one of the dimensions I'm going to suggest is fruitful for making comparisons across these two countries with the rise of urbanization in both of them is comparisons along the rural and urban, um, uh, along the rural and urban line. I think this can yield interesting patterns. So um, an example of this is um, analysis that we did on the gender gap in turnout in Pakistan's um, 2018 elections. So what we found here was that the gender gap in turnout is actually larger in the largest metropolitan cities of Pakistan. So in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, it's larger in Peshawar than anywhere else, um, than, than the province on average. In Punjab, it's larger in Lahore than the rest of the province. In Sindh and Karachi, in Balochistan, in Quetta. And um, it's my understanding that overall turnout patterns in India follow a similar logic, though this analysis hasn't been done for the gender gap, which is that um, overall turnout is lower in the largest metropolitan cities compared to smaller towns and villages. So I think there's something really interesting here about the way urbanization and the urban context is a similar shaping force in these two countries that are otherwise very different on national level, state level, and provincial level um, the factors that we would care about. 
I'm going to end on um, the question of identity politics. And I think we have a lot of dimensions of identity politics to talk about, the way in which caste as a mobilizing identity is changing um, in India, the way um, religious identity has been used in Pakistan since um, 1947 um, and, and before 1947, of course. Um, but what I, I think is kind of distinctive about um, 2018 and 2019 is the question of who is an Indian and who is a Pakistani coming up in a very real way in, in the lead up to both elections. And what's uh, striking is that this question is coming up not just as an ideological or mobilizational question, it's coming up as a legal question. So in the case of India, um, with regards to the National Registry of Citizens, um, in the case of Pakistan, um, the citizenship status of, um, uh, of Afghan refugees who are in Pakistan, um, in the case also of the, uh, of the Ahmadi Muslim population in Pakistan and uh, the rights that they have and don't have. So these, this legalistic aspect of identity and the way the state um, controls the borders of who is an Indian and who is a Pakistani, I think there's something <laughs> quite terrifying there. Um, and it's also a, a parallel trend that's happening in both countries. And, and I think comparison there is, uh, is important. And I'll, I'll stop there and hope to pick more of this up in Q&A. Yeah. Please sit. I'll, maybe I want the screen to go up. Um, so if there's anyone who can kind of... Perfect. Thank you. Great. So as um, Milan mentioned, this is your part one. This is your intellectual feast. Uh, and we're kind of like at the end of the main course, but really everyone knows it's all about the dessert. And so that's where we're at. But just, I should have said at the beginning, this is also actually going to be followed by a literal feast. So the opening reception for the Center for Contemporary South Asia will be happening right after this panel at 4 PM. So I hope that um, we will see uh, most of you there. I was also reminded that I'd actually forgotten to introduce myself. So my name is Prerna Singh. And and uh, I'm the Mahatma Gandhi Associate Professor of Political Science and International Studies. I work on, that's my own timer for Sarah, who, um, so I was uh, kind of, um, I had this idea that Ashu loved, um, and it's one of the many reasons I love Ashu, um, that uh, we had a resident sitar player, and not just any old sitar player, a sitar virtuoso as part of the Center for Contemporary South Asia. And so that, you know, when people went over time, rather than timers such as this, we would have the Oscars, you know, the Academy Award Orchestra, by which we would have the sitar drowning out our speakers. Um, and and Srinivas is actually here today. But we didn't need to do that, um, because everyone um, was on time, which means so the good news is that we have plenty of time uh, today for discussion. And so I thought what we'll do in terms of maximizing participation and the time that we have is just collect questions. Um, if any of you have a question that's directed at a particular speaker, please do say so. Um, otherwise, you know, a kind of general reflection comment, and then we can give each of you a kind of chance to respond to questions directed towards you, but also um, more broadly. If they can introduce themselves. Like yes, that would be actually excellent um, as kind of part part of our, our kind of mission to build community, if you could also introduce yourselves, uh, that would be really helpful. <coughs> Great. Um, my name is Liam. I'm an undergraduate senior translating in history and Southeast Studies um, here at Brown. Um, I'd love to hear uh, more reflection on the NRC, which you mentioned, Professor Khan. Um, maybe, especially Professor Tabur sort of reflected to your idea that the BJP after 2019 is a uh, work on political majoritarianism, which is distinct from Hindu nationalism, I think. Uh, that might have been at the very end of your talk. And so maybe expanding that some and how that relates to certainly what's going on in Kashmir, but I'm also more interested in the NRC question, too. Great. Thank you, Liam. Yes. Uh, my name is Harry Blair. I'm a visitor from Yale. And uh, very happy to be here. My first visit to uh, to Brown, and I uh, very much enjoyed this wonderful panel. I have a question that uh, several of you might have some ideas on, and that's about the difference between the two countries.
2018 legislative assembly elections and the 2019 national elections. When uh, these things, when three or four states, uh, Chhattisgarh and Rajasthan, and uh, was MP, uh, voted against the, uh, the BJP in 2018, people like us began to think, well, maybe the 2014 election was an aberration. Uh, then these, all these states uh, went heavily for the BJP in, in the next round in 2019. So my question is, how do we explain this difference? How do we explain what went on in 2018 as opposed to 2019? A really kind of curious situation. So I'd be very interested in your thoughts on this. Great. Thank you, and welcome to Brown. Uh, yes. Great, thank you. So uh, maybe... You, could you explain a little bit more? Could you say a little bit more about that? Sorry. Um, so I think just the fact in terms of um, nationalistic fervor that's used by both parties and how a lot of people are now talking about if India has an opposition party in the first place in terms of both, both, of, and both of these large majority parties being more center, being more right wing, do we need a more left liberal opposition and how important that is in terms of uh, contributing to, you know, a change in that electoral sort of... So is Congress a soft Hindutva party? Is implied in that, right? And how different is it from okay. the Enough food for thought? Should we... It's a lot. Yeah? Okay, great. How do you, how do you want to start? So maybe in the river, I mean, I think maybe, you know, whoever kind of feels a pressing need, but not Ashu, given that, you know, we are on home territory, so we let, like... Um, yeah, our guests first. Our guests first, yeah. yeah. So maybe Pradeep? No. No? <laughs> Miran then. Okay. Well. Uh, so let me take a couple of the questions that came at the end, work backwards. Um, I think... Um, for the state versus national, I think, Harry, that was your question. Um, I mean, I do think that this came as a surprise to many of us. Not that the BJP did better than the Congress in the national elections in Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, where they had lost. Um, but that uh, the Congress did so poorly in, in all of them, right? I mean, you could have said, okay, well, maybe they'll at least win four or five seats in Rajasthan, if not, you know, 15 or 20, and they won, they won precisely zero. Um, well, so the I think, question is, how, why did Congress win those? Yeah, so it, it yeah, so I think there's a couple of things going on. I think one is that um, voters seem to be, and I think Pradeep would back me up on this, uh, based on the Lokniti data, making a very clear distinction between who they would like to see in power at the state level and who they want to see in power at the national level, uh, where even in the surveys that were being done on voter behavior in those three state assembly elections, people said, when it comes to the national election, I'm with Modi. I still support the BJP, right? So um, this decoupling is happening in, in the voters' minds. I think that's the first thing. I think the second thing to point out is that um, the Congress interpreted from those three state elections that there was a pro-Congress mood in the country, which I think was a fundamental uh, strategic uh, miscalculation. If you look at the data, uh, where in constituencies in those three states where the Congress was the incumbent uh, at the state level, mm -hmm. their vote share actually went down. Uh, which means that there wasn't some kind of uniform shift. People were just pissed off. And they were, it happened to be the BJP's bad fortune that they had more incumbent seats than the Congress did. But I think the Congress took this as to mean there was something in the air that was pro-Congress around the country, and I don't think that was the case. Then we get to the campaign, where I think there, 
um, the combination of events in Puwama plus the organizational, technological, financial advantages that the BJP has when it comes to national elections is just quite you know, unparalleled. Um, and so I think it, it's hard to point to any one of these things, but the, these are the combination of factors I think that were important. I think to the question about the opposition, um, I, I think the Congress finds itself in a real bind because uh, they had had two big claims to fame previously, right? One was this adherence to secular uh, nationalism, and the second was this idea that they had constructed the foundations of the kind of modern Indian welfare state. And I think what the BJP has done is to take both of those things and turn them into um, uh, liabilities in different ways. One is that uh, due to the actions of the secular parties uh, themselves, but also because of the, the arguments put forward by the BJP, secularism has become a four-letter word, right? It's become coterminous in India with minority appeasement. And so even the Congress, I think, is unwilling, if you look at their manifesto, the word secular doesn't appear once anywhere in the Congress manifesto, right? So they're uncertain about going to election on those grounds because they think they'll be painted into a corner. And so if they want to go back to this idea of secularism, I think it, they are going to have to reconstruct it. I think the Nehruvian construct of, of having a kind of equal embrace of all fates and an equal distance from all fates no longer uh, holds sway because I think people believe that um, that's just code for, for pandering. On the developmental side, I think uh, what the government has done, whether through some Machiavellian uh, uh, concede or not, has essentially saturated the welfare discourse, right? So when it comes to a lot of the schemes that the Modi government is rolling out, the only opposition that Congress can muster is, well, well, we would do those things even bigger, and we would do them even better, but they can't really attack them on their foundations because many of them have been Congress ideas, you know, in the first place. So I think, uh, I think they're sort of between a rock and a hard place, and I'm not sure that it, uh, in addition to their leadership deficits, if they understand how to get out of these ideological, uh, this ideological hole that they're in. Sarah? Sure, so I'll pick up on this question of the weak opposition as well. And just to add um, on that is that, you know, you can, we can look on the one hand at party level factors, which include um, a leadership deficit, a failure to produce um, an, ideologic, like, uh, an ideological brand that is appealing. I think an, another important factor to look at is the environment that they're operating in and um, the ability that they have to um, to appeal to voters in um, in media outlets um, and to and for citizens to express dissent against um, the incumbent. And so in um, in Pakistan, for instance, um, the uh, the incumbent party, uh, the PMLN, faced um, <coughs> heavy restrictions on their actual campaigning. And this is probably not true to the same extent in India, but we do know about um, attacks on the freedom of the press, um, the ability uh, with which journalists are, uh, are able to write freely and the levels of self-censorship that exist in the press. Um, I think it's also important to think about um, the uh, who owns the media and that structure of media ownership and um, the fact that it's becoming really important in making opinions, but who gets to make those opinions. Um, so in, in some sense, there are all of these party level factors, but then there's also the, the bigger question of, is it a level playing field? Great, thank you. I think the NRC, do you want to say something about yeah, that? Uh, yeah. I also actually want Pradeep to explain a bit more the distinction between political majoritarianism and Hindu nationalism. I so, think there's something there. I, I do believe there's, but I, let, let, let's hear from him. Uh, I, I, for me, uh, the one way to think about that is that even if um, a lot of people are voting uh, on grounds of political majoritarianism, um, certainly the ideologues in the BJP are reading it as uh, an endorsement of Hindu nationalism. Um, and uh, this may generate, uh, I mean, wh who will control the agenda of the, of the BJP then becomes a critical question. How do you read the verdict, 
right? How do you read the verdict, and who will read the verdict, and who will, who's who's reading the verdict will become the verdict, uh, the reading of the party, right? That that's all. Uh, that's a that kind of um, um, sort of interpretive question uh, after a verdict is always extremely important. So let's see what uh, what uh, Pradeep has to say about that. Now, um, d the difference between 2018 um, uh, state elections and 2019 parliamentary elections, a complete wipeout of, uh, for example, Congress party in Rajasthan. Tw all 25 went to BJP, and they won pretty handsomely, uh, at least in seat terms, but if not in vote terms in Rajasthan in December of 2018. I think I agree with everything that uh, that Milan has said, but I would like to emphasize the the Pulwama and Balakot, uh, uh, if you will, an, an entirely exogenous inter intervention into the electoral universe in India. And the basis for that claim is, first of all, we were conceptually proposing that as a hypothesis, some of us, many of us actually, not just, it was not me alone, um, that this might become a national security election. It is happening so, clo so close to the, and for the first time it will be a national security election in India. Now the CSDS Lokniti data that all of us rely on to various extents has, uh, has asked, uh, asked voters, did you hear about Pulwama and Balakot? Did you vote for BJP? Those who had heard about Pulwama and Balakot and voted for BJP compared to those who did not and vote. That that spike is 12 percent. That actually is higher than Ujwala in in the in the CSDS data. Is higher than housing. Toilet question was not asked surprisingly, and I don't know why it was not asked. Uh, we don't know what what spike toilets made, but the spike produced by national security is the highest of all the issues on the agenda. Uh, is higher than Ujwala that that has been summed up here. Uh, would you realize a spike is eight percent? Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, maybe if yeah. Do do we truly have an opposition party? Uh, I think uh, Milan is said enough. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Pradeep. Last oh, I have to say something. Oh, sorry. Yes. First, I agree. I agree with everything Ashu says. So thank you. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Let me talk a little bit about political majority and its went into nationalism because I think they're closely linked, but they're slightly different. Mm. And the reason it's important to understand that difference is that there is, you know, Brigo is shaking his head, thank you, right, rightfully so. But let me start by saying the idea of Hindu nationalism puts the idea of Hindu nationalism front and center in the debate. And if you watch the BJP's campaign this time, they were forcing, they were focusing generally on equality for all. You know, that was the distinction they were drawing. Now, if you're, and the way this plays out is the following, mm -hmm. Hindu nationalism, especially becomes directly entangled with which God and who's Hindu, what is a Hindu. And that debate plays out not so well within the Hindu community on the ground. Because the upper caste will see it in one particular way, and Hindu nationalism falls directly in the ambit of the Hindu upper castes. That's why the Hindu upper caste, even when you look at the data and the upper class people, actually are more likely to say that this is about Hindu nationalism. Question is, how do you bring the others on board when the discourse on Hindu nationalism is owned by a particular caste group? And that's why the strategy of political majoritarianism plays this double-edged sword. You know, it's not, double edge is not the right word, but plays can placate all sides. Because if you are a group and you're the rising middle class who's rising up by their bootstrap, you don't want special provisions for anybody, right? Because this is all, you know, we are all doing this ourselves, and you know, we can make this ourselves. And this appeals a lot, we are arguing, across caste lines to these new middle classes, not to the poor. And that is the distinction we draw, which is the, what they are saying is, we are representing the political will of the majority in which everybody will be treated the same. And they keep stressing that. So whether you right or wrong, when Modi introduces a scheme for Muslim girls, that's what he says, it's for everybody. And that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to make the ship lift for everybody. That's my only goal in life. And I think that pl the message plays its heart itself out differently. If he got up and, uh, the hypothetically, the counterfactual is, what if Modi got up and stood and said, I'm going to represent the interests of the Hindus? He cannot. Do you think he would get? Constitutionally, he cannot. As a prime minister, he cannot. Yeah, he, yeah. But 
Because he'll be violating the constitution if no, he no, says no, that. Yeah, but, yeah, but he cannot say in an election. He can, yeah. you, you, you can say it in, in much a, more. It has to be coded. Yeah. It, it has to. It cannot be openly said. Yes, yeah. but you. But they have said it before, which is yeah, you know exactly. they can say Amitra it's an Hindu right? they, They've said things. That you can. His people can say that. They try to back away from it, <clears throat> right? And there's a reason for it. The reason is that idea itself has doesn't still doesn't have much support in India. See what's surprising to me, what's shocking to me in this all this election business is. And this is what's truly disturbing as well, is how thin these debates are and how quickly you can wedge people into opposite camps. Right? It shows us if these results are correct, it shows us how thin the veneer of that secular liberal was because it's been suddenly changed overnight. It also means, if you're hopeful, that maybe this veneer, this was also thin enough, and maybe this will collapse. If you're a pessimist, you'll say this is not going to collapse. If you're an optimist like me, I have to be an optimist, otherwise the consequences don't look particularly good, right? You would have to say that, listen, this can change. And so to me, that's what's amazing. And what's really more difficult to understand, which we actually academics have not spent much time on, is how, it, and if this is really a fundamental, the question is, a, is this a fundamental shift or is this just a playing up of people's, so in other words, this idea was always there. Mm -hmm. People had multiple opinions. Some people were secular, using this word very usually. Some of they had fundamentalist tones. I could cleave that, right? I can suddenly make this an issue. That's one way to think about it. The other way to think about it is, this is a long-term transformation that has been a long, -term, long time coming. And that means there is a ground forces that are actually working to make this happen. And they're actually transforming Indian society. And there's a third interpretation, which is the mm -hmm. scariest of the lot. And the third interpretation is that there is a political party that can come to power, and that power can actually switch people's opinions like this. Right? And I don't know which one of those it is, to be honest. People have different ideas. People have different opinions. But I don't know which one of these it is. Is, the, is this opinion thin? Has the wedge been created by politics and it's permanent? Or is the wedge has actually been created by social transformations that have been happening on the ground for a very long time? And they're now exacerbated. We just missed it. And in fact, my own personal view is that I'll give you a hint, and you can think about this. Think of where the schools are, and who, who's running schools in India, and what is being taught in the schools. Great, thank you. So we have about 20 minutes, and I think perhaps the best thing to do would be at this point just collect as many questions as we can, so we can still stick with introducing yourselves and then keeping the question brief, as will the eventual comments also be. Great. Um, excellent. So, um, Bhrigu? Ashu's thought process, which is very refreshing and interesting to see. So I think no one would disagree with the basic shift you're saying, illiberal, major, majoritarian. But I wonder that if, like Patrick had argued about degrees of democracy, one could think about degrees of emergency and say that... Degrees of emergency. emergencies. Emergencies, okay. Instead of degrees of democracy, you could say degrees of emergency. And you say that how do minorities respond in conditions of disenfranchisement and what are the conditions under which violence arises historically in different many of the polities you've named, like <laughs> Sri Lanka, etc. Uh, because I've, I've been trying to pay close attention to that in urban poor Muslim neighborhoods, seeing how the things that are surprising, basically, like Indian poor Indian Muslims in North Indian neighborhoods, distancing themselves quite strongly from Kashmir, saying this is not our problem, it has nothing to do with us. Uh, or the surprise in confronting the Hindi press right now in railway stations and stuff in India, which is literally like the Hindi word lalkarna, or kind of goading, gloating. You'll have pictures of Muslim clerics saying, the Muslim is scared. So that's what you see right now at railway station. So for me, the interesting question from you, from a historian or a kind of political scientist of ethnic conflict, civil war, etc., if one were to go more specifically into the history and say that rather than the category illiberal majority, what are the specific conditions under which violence arises? And are we seeing those conditions in place in India in comparison to, say, Sri Lanka, etc., Malaysia, Indonesia? 
Great. Thank you. Prigupati Singh, um, Anthropology Department. You forgot to introduce yourself um, <laughs> in the Center for Contemporary South Asia. Great. Um, sorry, it was show of hands again. Okay, so I'm going to, I have a list. I have, um, we'll start with graduate students and our incoming graduate student who works on India, uh, Connor. Corner, you will have to speak a bit louder. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, yeah you're very <laughs> soft. <laughs> um, can Admirably you, so, but that, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, my question is why has uh, Muslim support for the BJP uh, between 2014 and 2019 uh, remained at basically the same level between these elections? Yeah. Despite the fact that the BJP hasn't fielded Muslim candidates, doesn't have any MLAs, or Muslim in Lok Sabha right now. And my question is, do you think, or why do you think that this sort of level of support has remained the same between these elections, despite the shift in the BJP's rhetoric and actions to be more aggressively anti-Muslim? And sort of, is this a result of some kind of strategic voting on behalf of Muslims? Is it some demographic trend that tends to hold, or is it uh, some other thing? Rehan Jamil. questions, but uh, first one was for Saya and uh, Pradeep as well. Um, I was curious um, in this sort of India-Pakistan comparison of how, particularly in the last election, um, in both countries, how India uh, plays in, uh, in Pakistani electoral politics and the campaign and, and vice versa, Pakistan. And I was struck, um, my um, in one of these sessions here a few years ago, uh, Professor Vazira Zamindar in history here had said, Pakistan has become an epistemic category in India, which has very little to do with the, the category in India. Category. And it has a lot, it's uh, less to do with the specific geographic space of Pakistan, and a lot, a much older debate going back perhaps all the way to partition about uh, the sp space of Indian Muslims and this, this kind of thing of go back to Pakistan. Or, Pakistan was a very alive, from my point of view, um, sort of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, electoral point in Indian politics. So conversely in Pakistan, my impression was, and I'm curious what you think, that in 2018 it was a much more inward looking election in Pakistan. Pakistan's old civil military fault lines, the, that debate coming to Punjab, vote pools, the go corruption, those agendas were being played out versus this. So I'd be curious what Saya and uh, Pradeep. Uh, Can others comment on that? Sure. Uh, Ashu, you're going to have 30 seconds, so you choose your battles. Um, okay, Bhanu? I, I would like to listen more about is this really a breakdown of the Nehruvian socialist consensus, but also like the capitalist, neoliberal 1990s consensus. Both of them are broken down and people are looking for something new. And Modi sort of offers both. Uh, this? Tibo. Yeah, hi, my name is Tibo Mathis. So I'm assistant professor at Boston College. Uh, and I would like to bring uh, class back in to that extent that is possible. 
and I know we, we know it's tri tricky in the Indian context, but um, my question is for you all, but I think I'm referring to a comment that you made pretty on this new catch-all party that the BJP has become. Um, and I was wondering whether you thought this was, I mean, we, we've seen this happening in a very spectacular way in, in UP two years ago, with this cons consolidation of the Hindu vote, uh, bringing very different uh, castes together with very different class interests, material interests, and that's, again, the case, I think, at a national level. So I was wondering whether you thought this was really, uh, I mean, aside from the impact of Modi's charisma, which seems to have played a very important role in, in 2017 UP and then again in the national elections, how sustainable is this coalition of different caste groups uh, in the future? Good. How is it? How sustainable is it? Mm. Oh, sorry, could you introduce yourself? Oh, hi, um, my name is Sunmay. I'm a master's student um, at the Watson, and uh, I was just curious. Probably a quick question. I don't follow Indian politics that much, but. Um, my question would be, does this, what are the trends at the state level for Indian elections, and do they support potentially, if they're in the same direction as 14 and 19 federal elections, in the sense that um, BJP support is increasing, or is it the opposite, if the trends are in the opposite directions, and they would suggest that um, there is kind of less faith in the Congress party, and that the opposition as a whole is weakening um, at a national level, but not so much at the state level. So what, which of those um, kind of views might be suggested, if any, if either of those? Um, my name is Patrick Heller, and I'm a sociologist. And Arthur Stinchcomb once said there's three variables in sociology, class, class, and class. So <laughs> not, you know, I don't want to be quite that reductionist. But I, I want to make a comparative point. As, as dramatic as this election was, the one in Brazil was off the radar, right? We went from a social democratic party to um, a, you know gay bashing, misogynistic uh, psycho who doesn't have a political party, right? So it's just, just complete out of the blue. Uh, and what the hell is happening? And yet, when you look at who uh, voted Bolsonaro into power and who supported the BJP, the most striking thing is the support of the middle class and the new middle class. They, sure, the BJP made inroads into the Dalit vote, etc. Bolsonaro made inroads into the favelas, but the core of the support is professionals. That's the single biggest occupational category in both cases. Mm -hmm. And then this what we're calling this new middle class. Yeah. Um, and so, I, and and you know, when we talk about the middle class, I mean, besides all the definitional problems. You know, once upon a time in political science, the middle class was associated with liberalism, with support for democracy. Now we're calling it illiberal, right? And yet this happened quite quickly. I mean, there was a time where the middle class in India was Congress and secular, et cetera. And likewise, the bit did was not always the Northeast Party, right? It was the Sao Paulo professionals, et cetera. So what, we know that the middle class can be fickle, um, but it has toggled really quickly here from being secular and, and liberal to being deeply illiberal, one could argue pot possibly because it feels threatened from below, uh, the second democratic upsurge, etc., uh, but also maybe because of the changing nature of the economy. Um, so I'd, I'd like to push you know, all of you to think a little bit more about what is it about this new middle class now and today that's made it uh, you know, basically um, 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 go from liberalism to liberalism so so quickly. Hi, um, Emmerich Davies, Assistant Professor of Education at Harvard University. Um, I wanted to to push a little on a question that Harry raised earlier and then Tanmar brought up um, again about um, the differences in the results between Rajasthan MP and Chhattisgarh at the, the state level and then um, at the national level. So in answering Harry's question, Milan, you, 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 you said, look, the, the national vote was a pro-Modi vote, um, and the state level vote was voters were pissed off with their, the, the candidate in power as an anti-incumbency vote. Um, and, and at least in hearing all of you talk, this, this seems to be in tension with the larger idea of a changing ideological composition of the Indian voter, right? Um, so, um, Pradeep, you had, you had two formulations uh, which seemed quite negative about the future of Indian uh, electoral politics in which, like, this was a long time coming, uh, or uh, the party in power sort of changes the way that people believe. But if that's true, that should percolate all the way up and down um, the election, um, election from state to national. Um, 
So who is this split ticket voter, right? Um, what were they thinking? Uh, is it an anti-incumbency vote at the state level? And is it a pro-Modi vote at the national level? Or is there something else going on? Because the two things that you guys are suggesting are sort of intention uh, there. So what are they thinking? Um, do we know from the data what they were thinking at the state level, what they were voting for at the state level? Um, and do we know from the data what they were thinking and what they were voting for um, at the national level? And what caused that sort of discrepancy in the vote? Great. So I'm, I'm going to just jump in um, as perhaps what will have to be the last question, which is, so, you know, if we're in this fourth party system following Millen, and if this is this illib illiberal deficit uh, that, that Ashu has pointed to, states of emergency, as Prabhu has called, I like that term, it's, uh, I think, a really nice way to understand this. And if Pradeep tells us that basically the issue is that the Hindu middle classes have kind of coalesced to put us in this position that we are, then what do we do? And so, you know, this point about do we even have an opposition um, and what exactly has been the failure of the opposition, but really has the failure been institutional to some extent or has the failure been ideational? So I think Sarah's point about what does it mean to be an Indian? And so um, Millen said, you know, secularism is this four-letter word. Uh, so even the Congress, which is like the bastion of secularism, is kind of afraid to, to use it. And so do we need to reconstruct secularism? But to me, the question is, do we really need to recover nationalism? Like, when did we let the word nationalist become something that only Hindu nationalists can use? And is there a kind of secular Indian nationalism? Perhaps we, And perhaps the thing here is that, like, do we find kind of like let go of Nehru, like literally. We let go of Rahul Gandhi and we let go of that Nehruvian dynasty. And do we try to kind of recover an Indian nationalism that is more Gandhian? So that being secular is not about a distance and a separation and a blindness to religion, but to say, look, I'm a Hindu. I fast, I sing Hindu bhajans, but I'm also an Indian nationalist. So is so how do we convince these Hindu middle classes? And you know, is 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 that the kind of ideational project uh, that we have to do? Because otherwise, we're 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 here, and it's not a good place. <coughs> okay, um, sorry. Uh, one and a half minute each, <laughs> and uh, and we oh no, Srinivas left. Otherwise, I was going to say he's, he's gone to get his sitar, guys. So <laughs> it's going to drown you out. Um, Where is which one? Which one? You start? No, you are Ashu. You go. Ashu, you're going to set the example of how you do this in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes. So you see, um, I I don't think it's right to say that Pakistan was always very important in India's electoral politics. Pakistan was important in India's elite politics, not in mass politics. We have very good data to show this. National security scholars, uh, people, Ashley Tellis and others, agree with Vipin Nar, they agree with me on this. It was important in elite politics, not in mass level uh, politics. What has happened now, and also Kashmir was not a matter for Indian, non-Kashmiri Indian Muslims. Kashmir was joined with Pakistan, not joined with non-Kashmiri Indian Muslims. In the, 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 there is very clear, uh, clear evidence for that also. What BJP has done under Modi, they have seamlessly connected Pakistan, non-Kashmiri Muslims and Kashmir as the old Muslim question of India, pre-47 Muslim question of India. These are three parts of the same question, according to the BJP. Whereas post-1950 constitutional settlement was that these are separate things. Right? So this is a remarkable political shift that has taken place under Mr. Modi and, and BJP. You, you bringing back these three aspects of the question together and getting us back to a pre-47 understanding of the so-called quote-unquote Muslim question. I don't like that term, the Muslim question. But, but that's, how they, that's the term they use. Okay. Right? Great. Okay. You chose your okay. question, Ashok. All right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Milan? <laughs> um, hopefully this conversation continues yes, yeah, yes, after absolutely. the reception because there's way too much here. That's the whole point. Yeah. Emmerich, I think, in, uh, is a super question which we have to think about, about if, this, if there's this whole change going on, why is it only happening at the national level? Why don't we see it? I mean, I think one answer to that question could be, and I don't know if Pradeep, who's, who's written the book on ideology, would subscribe to this, but actually perhaps there's greater convergence at the state level than we might think. I mean, if you look at the manifestos of the Congress party in, B in Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Chhattisgarh, uh, there was a lot of stuff in that which we've traditionally seen more in BJP manifestos, like cow well, protection, cow protection. You, you know, what they've done even since governing, using the, using the National Security Act in Madhya Pradesh to 
And so I think getting back to this Nehru Gandhi question that Prerna raised, I mean, perhaps the median Congress MLA, or MP for that matter, is actually much more firmly in the Hindu traditionalist camp than we've previously conceptualized, right? Um, and I think that's something that's perhaps sort of worth thinking about, and I don't know if we have, Pradeep could tell us if we have good data um, on this. So just very quickly in my maybe 15 or 20 seconds left, you know, one thing to point out about this hegemony construct of the fourth party system is that this doesn't mean that the BJP will be immune to electoral losses, right? I mean, I think one thing important to point out is I, I think this is true, that the BJP has not won any assembly election in 2018 or 2019. That's outright. Uh, they formed governments by toppling others, but they've not actually won an outright election, um, which suggests that if you take out the Modi question, that there is some... Angst don't, about don't say that because the next elect state elections they are going to win. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's true. <laughs> Just the sequencing of the election, right? right. No other reason. Great. Um, so maybe actually focusing on some of the questions like class yeah. um, and others that I think were important but didn't get addressed. Or um, so on this question of class and um, why the new middle class looks illiberal rather than liberal and. While I don't have an answer, I'm going to suggest that perhaps we need to look at it along with urbanization, um, because this new middle class is also an urban new middle class. And that means that that has implications for changes, and it ha has implications for the rapid pace of change in these people's lives, which I think can lead to um, a desire for something that looks familiar and stable. Um, I think the other question is, who does it bring together in the same space? and what tensions does that produce? So that's my, um, that's not my answer, but perhaps uh, one of the things to think about in relation to this question. Um, on how India and Pakistan figure into each other's elections, I think what the Indian election and um, the aftermath has done is bring the two nation theory up into conversation again, which is um, interesting and I wish we weren't in this place, but um, uh, I, I would push back on the idea that India wasn't part of the um, of the Pakistan election because certainly not in rhetoric and mobilization, but in terms of the fact that um, the PMLN lost the military's favor because of Nawaz Sharif's um, independence, uh, desire for independence on foreign policy towards India. So it's always in the background, even if it isn't part of the rhetoric um, in, in the electoral period. Okay, let me start by uh, give a quick I will answer the class question, and I'll just just make it even more you know provocative. But let me answer Emmerich's questions first. I think you are right. There is a possibility for answering this question precisely, and there is a way to do it. It requires a lot of data work, but it's actually possible to do, and we can discuss how to do it. But I think, still think it remains an important question, which is if this if the argument I'm making is correct, has why hasn't this ideology seeped all the way down, and what's going on, right? And that's something we can we can surely discuss. And I do not have an answer off the top. Let me get to the middle classes. I think what we keep forgetting, and we should keep this in mind, that at the heart of the Indian enterprise post-independence was that the state was going to provide, was a moral signpost for providing resources for everybody. The moment that state becomes to be presented as not a body that represents everybody's interest, but is instead a corrupt organization that represents the points and interests of a very few people who are standing in the way, what happens is that opens up the middle classes to reject the idea of the parties that represent those politics. Now, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily becoming a liberal. I think that's a little bit far-fetched. I think that's too strong. But I think what's happening is they're rejecting that version of statism that version in which the state was going to be the arbiter of all things, that's not happening. The, the state failed and the parties representing that state failed in delivering that. And as the group, size of this group grew, they realized that all these, all these roadblocks, think of the famous rally in India Gate with the AAP, right? What was it about? They were not seeking to rescind privileges, but they were just uh, campaigning against a state that had become very particularistic. And I think that's what's driving all of this. And I'm, that's why, unlike a lot of others here, I, I wrote in 2014 that the BJP had a fragile mandate, tells you what I know, 
But I actually <laughs> even now think, right, that even though I think there's a lot to go here, I think it's true. And to answer your question, Thibault, and I'll say this to you, I think for a very, very long time, we have been focused too much in our categories, and our way of thinking of our categories is the owl of Minerva. Things are changing on the ground faster than we can imagine, and we need to imagine a new category or a new way of thinking about caste in India than the way we've understood it and the way we have actually parlayed its influence and its impact on politics. I think we need to reimagine that, because if we don't reimagine it, we will be always stuck in the Akhilesh Yadav mold, which is I've got my Mahagat Bandhan and I'm going to win the election. Great. I want to thank you all, thank the panelists, um, and also to thank our kind of silent uh, power horses, uh, which is Stephanie and Grace, for organizing this all. And to leave you, um, I was recently freshman advisor and learned this game, Two Truths and a Lie, which I'd never played before. So I want to leave you by saying one of the reasons why I want to in encourage you to chat not just with each other, but with the panelists, is that one of the panelists here today called Nargis, the iconic Indian film actress, Masi, aunt. And so I leave you to guess at the end of this panel <laughs> which is. one of these panelists had Nargis uh, as an aunt. And thank you so much, and hopefully we can get a beer or a glass of wine or a samosa. Thanks.